Well, hello everybody. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Tumble and mixing agglomeration. So we'll call this agglomeration two. My sources again are here, references are listed. Very good books. And we'll talk a bit about a little bit about operations as well. Most common <clears throat> tumble agglomeration is probably most common. It occurs naturally, uh, doesn't have to be forced. Uh, particles move over each other, they rub, and they call us merge into another particle. No special equipment is necessary. <laughs> and no binder is needed. Binding forces must be higher than the separating forces and must endure over time. Must endure over time. Further binding uh, leads to further growth. Uh, weak agglomerates will form. Uh, they will then break up. Uh, stronger agglomerates will form and remain and continue to grow. What size and how to stop the growth is important in operational problems. The hearing particles are often smaller particles with a high surface area. The size of agglomerating particles are between 100 and 200 microns. 10 to 50 micron particles adhere easy, easily, adhere easily. Agglomeration of larger particles usually requires a binder heat or some mechanism to cause coalescence. So if I'm looking at tumble agglomeration, I have a pretreatment perhaps, mixing materials together, perhaps binders and particles, possible use of a machine to create seeds. So I have a seeding machine. Tumbling occurs to form a green agglomerate and the agglomerate, agglomeration is stopped the, uh, stopping dust or something of that nature, or a flow out in a continuous manner. The green agglomerates are further processed. They're not, they may not be very strong. Spherizing, drying, curing. Cured agglomerates are sized if needed. Undersized are then recycled. Uh, oversized are crushed, rescreened, and then recycled. Post-treatment may consist of additional of a coating or anti-caking agent, further dry, drying and hardening. So you have uh, tumbling can be different. One method would be uh, motion or movement is a densely dispersed powder in a rolling action. Basically, a second keeps particles suspended and loosely dispersed, say, in a fluidized bed. Other methods are also possible. Binding uh, binders are usually sprayed on the particle, and different processes, uh, uh, different processes basically occur. Agglomeration occurs by coalescence. Here's uh, two. Here's a picture. We can have granular growth uh, due to nucleation, where there's a whole bunch of powder particles, and suddenly there's a particle. There's coalescence, basically merging of two, two particles. Or you could potentially have a layering. You have a previous seed particle running through powder, and then you build up a layer. There's also, in the reverse, shows the breakage. You can have it shatter. You can have it fragmented. You can have it wear away by abrasion. Then you can also have abrasion transfer where you have two particles that collide and part of one goes to the other. The separated dots are represent free fine and working unit. So if we go up here, we have nucleation, coalescence, and abrasion transfer. Abrasion transfer, layering without crushing. Crushing and layering, one particle crushes into another particle and the material is added to the particle. Material is trying to attach itself to particles with better binding properties. So you have different growth behavior will occur depending upon the material and the equipment. 
Now, the curing step obviously is an important step in strengthening the uh, agglomerate. Replaces green agglomerates with stronger bonding mature agglomerates. Solid bridges may be forming in this process, possibly cindering, chemical reactions, partial melting, crystallization, and solidification. Now, if we take a look at dense phase agglomeration of balling or granulating drum, drums, materials fed into the drum at one end, segregation will take place, the particles size will separate. Fines tend to settle to the bottom, much like a box of Cheerios, the fines settles in the bottom. Binders may be sprayed along the top of the bed and weight the coarse particles, and what's the coarse particles. The coarse and intermediate particles pick up the smaller particles and fines as they rotate the bed, as they rotate in the bed. In rotation, only strong bonds survive. Right. Location of the binder spray plays a key role in the process, believe it or not. The binder feed location determines the strength of the particles. That's interesting. I'll give you a point in case. What we're talking about is we have the feed here. We have a balling drum. We have a exit dam down here. But in there, we also have the spray bar. Now, the spray bar could only Go, the spray only hits on, only a portion of the top of the bed, or it hits all of the bed, depending upon basically how, how what you want as a product. Again, there could be a partial wetting of the bed or full wetting of the bed. When the binder is not sprayed near the discharge, what happens is the growth stops. Okay, so the binder is being spread. A, only over top some of the top surface. Oversized and weaker agglomerates will break apart. The stronger, smaller, drier agglomerates are discharged, hopefully. When the binder is sprayed along the entire length of the drum, the wet and relatively loose agglomerates are formed and discharged. So the spray, the binder spray length help helps and the, to, to determine the uniformity, strength, and moisture of the final product. So the question I pose to you is, do you know your spray length? And have you basically considered adjustments of it? And up here, you have a scraper bar to uh, perhaps put a liner in there for you. Spray length should be considered an important operating variable along with rotational speed. Faster the rotational speed, the faster the growth, the more denser, uh, drier the agglomerate. Well, maybe yes. The binder quantity is adequate. Maybe no, if the binder quantity is insufficient. Faster the rotational speed, the more breakage of the agglomerate occurs. Okay. So I don't know if you've noticed that in your data. Oftentimes, the best place to study something is with your own equipment in the plant. So you can do plant experiments. You know, just be uh, aware of the different changes that you've made, and if you can, and measure the results. Or on drums. Drums are simple, used in processing large quantities of material, relatively crude and unsophisticated. Useful in getting job done in a rough environment. Often needs a large close cycle, closed circuits recycle. That's the problem with drums. Drums recycle a lot of material. Equipment is in a cylindrical tube at minus 90, or excuse me, minus 10 degrees. That's to let the product out. Lots of equipment have tilts to them. Okay, heat exchangers have tilts for drainage. Right, this uh, has a tilt to it to encourage the motion down the length of the drum so it can exit. Retaining rings are at the, uh, at the ends prevent spillage and increase material depth and resonance, resonance time. Can be lined with cement or expanded metal to encourage buildup 
of the material itself is the wear langer. You may or may not like that because what it has built up in the material itself means it'll be in there for a long time. If it's in there for a long time, it may properties may not be remain the same. Thickness of the wear liner is determined by the scrapers. Scrapers have different different designs. Some are reciprocating, some are oscillating. Material buildup as a wear liner may not be desirable for some products. We said that. Movement of material changes with rotational speed. There's three or three regimes that can happen with powders in rotating drums. The rotation is too low, the material just slides up the side of the drum and then slips back down. Slides up the side of the drum and slips back down. There is no rolling action. The entire mass may actually agglomerate. That would be terrible. Too high of a rotational speed, the material is lifted high along the wall and breakage may occur, basically. Just right, the rotational speed because of the rolling action which forms agglomerates. So it's very important. Recognize that Goldilocks principle again, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. So just right. Length usually varies 2.5 to 3.5, the tilt minus 10. I'm not quite sure what it would happen in plus 10. Uh, it means the uh, the bed would be tilted towards the free uh, towards the feed area drum can retain material in the drum and allow loosely sized product uh, agglomerates to be produced this is a fairly interesting graph here or graphs i should say one of the more interesting ones is we have pellet size and over time uh, the time distribution uh, grows basically. Batch drum growth of limestone pellets by layering right, data with time. Nice distribution. What's interesting is the distribution shape doesn't, deter, deter, it doesn't change. Here's one in normalized where you have a number of different runs and cumulative fra number fraction distribution. Self-preserving size distribution for batch coalescence drum granulation. Kind of an interesting idea. Then we have this graph here. This is probably, I lifted it from uh, Perry's handbook, but there's references in there as well. Uh, what we have on the x-axis is the number of drum revolutions. Now, uh, Rotation, rotating equipment is very important because it's the number of revolutions that material experiences, right? Not necessarily the time, but the number of revolutions the material has experienced. And that characterizes your process. So if you're talking about processing time, okay, you have a certain processing time. Take that times the rotational speed and that will give you the number of revolutions the material has experienced. Yeah, just take another one, uh, take another example. You have a clothes dryer at home. It has a drying time of 30 minutes. Now that's really an awkward way of looking at it from an engineering perspective. 30 minutes. Okay, suppose you took the sheets out of the washer, put it in the dryer, and you turned on the dryer, but not the tumbling action. That'd probably be difficult to do. But there was no tumbling action. And after 30 minutes, the sheets would still be wet, or the clothes would still be wet. So there's an example of uh, time being practically worthless. Instead of thinking in terms of time, you should think in terms of the number of tumbles. Clothes in your dryer at home dry because they're tumbled. Okay. Now, what's interesting in some cases with your dryer, clothes dryer at home, is they can, the sheets can ball up into a big ball and tumble. Okay. 
But there, after they form this big ball, the diffusion of water out of the sheets is very long. And the dry, they're not dry after, say, 30 minutes. So uh, sheets undergone, uh, underwent, by balling up, they changed their, their flow nature, their tumbling nature, and gave you poor results. This is the idea that I was talking about. I go here. There's three uh, ways stuff move in a drum. One, they sli as slide as an entire mass with very little rolling action. They can be centrifuged to the wall, or it can be just right with a rolling, tumbling action. These are sort of, you best call those different flow regimes. Here, uh, the drum revolutions are important as well as the moisture content. You can see with the lowest moisture content, I tend to grow slowly. Okay, at higher moisture contents, 60, uh, 46, 47, 40, I grow much faster and I reach maximum or an equilibrium where there's growth and breakage going on at the same time. The higher the saturation, the faster the growth is. But then I reach pretty much the same size up here a bit. And notice there's a break in the curve. This one, the break in the curve's not showing. But I would walk away from this with the idea that uh, moisture content and drum revolutions are the important items. Sizing, uh, balling drums, little published information. Loadings are from 0.1 to 3.3, 3, 30% uh, hold up, maybe more. Sizing is based upon testing angle, RPM, hold up, and spray behavior by, by a lot more than 0.3. You're pushing your equipment, you get, you get most product out. So you push your equipment. You're typically operating at 25 to 40% of critical speed. Critical speed is where the material is centrifuged to the wall. General scale-up procedure exists. Lots of quantities change on scale-up. If I look at uh, balling drum circuits, agglomeration equipment is usually part of a circuit, right? So I have some sort of bin, some sort of feeder going to a turbulator. The turbulator produces seeds probably and goes to some sort of conditioning bin. And then it goes to a feeder to another turbulator, which creates and then drops down into a pellet, a disc pelletizer. Here I have bins over here. These are called surge bins, interesting. Anyway, go to a turbulator, create, create seeds, which then are pelletized in a pelletizer, then fed to a fluidized bed or a rotary dryer and dried. Then it's sieve operations, sieving operations or screening operations, the overside material is sent back. The undersides material is also sent back. Fines are recycled. And then I take the uh, intermediate size off as a product. And I may even take some of that and freeze it, uh, have it recycled back. So a hammer mill, a hammer mill destroys all agglomeration, hopefully reduces it back down to a powder and goes back up into the bin. Now what bothers me about this somewhat, not necessarily all that much, but the binder is already in this recycle. So I may have some material having uh, binder in it up here. And they have a binder in a surge bin, it's sort of like asking for trouble, or a bin, a binder in any bin, you're sort of asking for trouble. But it's interesting, this turbulizer or turbulator is being used for blending this binder in with the, the material. 
Interesting. And of course, if I have a fluidized bed or any sort of airstream, looks like it's a partition bed here. I may have to have a dust collector. Usually that would be a, a cyclone, followed by, if the dust is serious, I would want the dust to be recycled. Very fine dust, might have to burn it or pass it through a cyclone. Uh, bag house, what electrostatic precipitator or a scrubber, scrubber cyclone by a house, electrostatic precipitator. Circuit design is very important. Mm -hmm. Typically, feed solid binder additives, recycled material mixed and metered, metered to a feeding system. Components are often mixed and fluffed on the belt. Liquid binders and additives are sprayed on the tumbling mass in the bed. Scrapers control the wall build up along the bed and spiral discharge at the excess produces uniform. Feed to the screening spiral would cause some sort of breakage of the weaker glomerates. Screen, maybe. Screens separate underside from oversized. Operations determined by rotational speed, depth of the material in the drum, the residence time versus growth rate of the agglomerate, right? Falling to the final agglomerate, falling to the final agglomerate size is usually not done in one pass for the drum. Recycle rates can be quite high, 100%, 400%. Sufficient nuclei must be produced to repeat replace pellets before the circuit. Growth rate has uh, to meet the desired production rate. Base rate of nuclei production must be stable and equal to the number of agglomerates are produced. Remember, each agglomerate comes from a seed, <clears throat> potentially a seed. Balling drums tend to surge in circuits, not clearly understood must be some sort of imbalance. Green balls produced are usually weak and require gentle handling and curing, drying, uh, hardening them perhaps, uh, cindering may be helpful. Screens are used for smoothing operations, used for smoothing operations, densifying, that's interesting, and discharge. Screens are used for densification. Hmm. Going to a pan pelletizer or disc pelletizer, we have this situation. Basically, uh, if I look, it's just a simple inclined shallow disc. Many, many applications exist, including fine and fines agglomeration. Similar uh, to a drum, but has uh, features distinctly different in growth phenomena. So if I look a look at this rotating pan, I see the heights, which they call a collar here. And then I have a reciprocating scraper here. I have sprays. I have, perhaps I have a concentrated liquor of some sort. Somewhere I have recycled fines. All right, somewhere I gotta put the fines in. They, Fines apparently are coming from this concentrated, concentrated solution. But I gotta have a fines, I have a have to have a solids feed here. Segregation occurs in the disc. The fines will sell to the bottom intermediates and the large agglomerates will be at the top. Overflow is when the particles get so big that they slide off the side. Many applications occur. We have all kinds of applications, right? And typical products. Bed segregation occurs. Bed is well, uh, wedge, wedge shaped. Larger agglomerates rotate to the outer rim and discharge. Progressively smaller agglomerates are observed towards the center of the pan as a distinct classification method, which allows for exceptional size control. 
feed is added at the top and doesn't usually include recycle. Right, feed locations, bind, uh, binder, and material control agglomeration growth. Most processes have agglomerates that wet, wet it first with a particular then particular feed and then added downstream. Two cases happen um, depending upon the relative amounts of liquid and solids. Addition of position relative to the overall pattern. Most material is picked up by the larger agglomerates, only a small amount of material goes to seeds. New seeds is the second case. New seeds produce most of the growth in small agglomerates. Case one, the feed and sprays are closer to the rim. Case two, the feeds and sprays are closer to the pan center. In both cases, you have a rounding abrasive transfer taking place. Overall growth is by layering. Okay. So uh, overall growth is by layering. So I want you to sort of, next time it snows, if you have snow, I want you to go outside and take a small, make a snowball with your hand. And then I want you to make a huge uh, snow, you make a snow person or snowman, snow woman. In which case you'll start with the bottom big ball and you'll take your snowball and roll it up. And basically it's an agglomerate, right, of sorts. And uh, it's built by layering, by the way, layering. So overall growth is by layering, snowmen, snow women are examples. And we should not leave out snow boys and girls or snow girls and boys. Size, strength of the agglomerates are influenced by the rim heights. That's interesting. I wonder how many of these pans are built with adjustable rims. Higher rims will produce rounder and stronger pellets. They're in there for a longer time, I suspect. Larger holdup volume, larger residence time, stronger. The, the binding. Seeds and formation, seed formation and growth occurs at the lower levels. Higher heights can cause uh, massive buildup. Sometimes it's difficult to produce enough seeds from the bottom, from the top feeding without incurring massive buildup material on the pan bottom. Bottom feeding may produce enough seeds without buildup. So here we have a picture of a rotating pan. You have spray locations here and here. You have three, uh, might we call them baffles or potentially scrapers to direct the flow somewhat. And down here you have the feed point. Over here we have the nuclei consisting of water trapped air and solid particles. So we have trapped air sitting in here. We have the particles and we have some sort of in situ water sitting there. Okay, here we have uh, water inlet locations. Maybe spray here, water being the binder, right? Spray here, spray here, spray here. And you have the pellet streams. And here we have feed locations. There's a location here, one here, and one way up here. Pan angle, maybe 60, 40 to 60 degrees. Diameter rim height speed, determine the disc inclination, determine the disc capacity. Material, oh, I forgot this one right in here. This is approximate capacity versus disc diameter disk diameter, and they have a square there, and um, I would like to point out that the data, if I look at the data, the data would suggest it's more of a cube than a square. This is a volume, Q is volume, and I have it related to an area. Uh, 
take this data and redo it and uh, investigate whether it's d cubed or if the height of the pan is not also included in here basically anyway it just to be a little bit skeptical this this line looks like a third power whether rather than a square uh, again, the diameter, rim height, speed, and inclination determine capacity. So here I don't have any speeds given. All right. That's what it said. Speed and inclination, no angles necessarily given. I guess I got to go back to the original data. Material buildup occurs on the bottom and used as a wear langer. Necessary to control buildup, stationary removable plows or scrapers remove excess buildup. Scrapers may also break up weak agglomerates. They may densify and strengthen stronger agglomerates. Performance of a disk is partially determined by the location and method of feeding and the number of distribution of the sprays. Here we have some capacity sitting here. Uh, three feet in diameter is pretty small. And we get up to 18 feet in diameter horsepower. Excuse me, horsepower sitting here. Capacity sitting here. We have for pelletizing as well, horsepower capacity. Now for mixing, it's interesting is consider these things for it mixing. They mix by essentially the feed and the feed is taken away, basically rotated. Dust covers, a likely pre-mixing is often done if feed and binder has several components. Makes sense. Discs are usually operated open circuit with no or little recycle. Large recycle on a pan indicates that you should make adjustments, right? Operating speed is typically 75.75 critical. Operating RPM cannot typically be varied by much after the diameter inclination material has been fixed. Rotational speed selected to provide maximum roll area for the agglomerate over the pan. Rotational speed is fixed by this condition. Another important pro uh, property is the angle of repose for the material. Basically, this fixes the pan tilt. The pan uh, must be greater than the angle of repose. Okay. If you want to know what the angle repose is, you pour stuff out on the on the countertop and note how it tilted, the angle it makes with the horizontal. Yeah, higher than the angle repose, so the stuff will fall. Uh, rim height and diameter are related by equation. Rim height increases with disk diameter. Scallop may be based upon equal frowd numbers or roll distance. I like roll distance a lot. Effects of uh, disk operating parameters on quality. Quality problems for agglomeration include rough surface texture from too little or too much moisture. You have a wide particle size distribution, shape variations. So characteristics of importance, size and shape, porosity, surface area, dissolvability, and resistance to breakage, right? You hope you have it round. You hope to have it, some sort of type of porosity that you want. You want some sort of surface area, dissolvability and resistance to breakage. Some characteristics are inter interdependent, however, right? High porosity leads to high surface area. High surface area leads to dissolvability, and that leads to low resistance to breakage. So, sort of a trade-off. 
size and shape depends upon a growth mechanism. Most uh, spherical shapes are obtained if everything is perfect. Adding additives and smaller particles can improve the sphericalness. The amount of fines determine the compressive strength. Contact areas are fewer. Contact points are fewer with large particles. Right? Agglomerates are weaker. Right? Fines fill in the contact points some, somewhat. Critical moisture exists for, for materials dependent upon porosity, size, distribution, wettability. The amount of liquid also influences pellet surface, right? Glomerates at optimum moisture conditions grow by Onion, onion layer, onion, when wetted by layers, here's an example of that. Here's what you're looking for, the onion skin just right. And feed per revolution, basically. If I have too many, too much moisture over here I am, I have too much moisture, then I form uh, raspberry lumps on the surface. An example of that would be if you have Boston baked bean candies, they have a uh, moist, bumpy surface to them. And you don't have enough moisture, you have too little moisture, you will have pits involved with, uh, you'll still have the onion, but the, uh, Pitting this will cause an increase in porosity, perhaps. Lower strength, higher porosity. And I just threw this in uh, here as a side comment about uh, size distributions. Here we have what might be considered your typical size distribution. But suppose you were able to make three different sizes, all right? or four or five different sizes were pretty precise. And then you can build material looking like this. Essentially, you can approach complete, uh, a completed solid nature. Here, the porosity will be fairly high. Here, the porosity could be quite low. So obtaining this might be a desire. So this is basically a solid or approaching a solid. So we have agglomerates developed at lower, below optimum moisture, relatively dry, brittle, may disintegrate, find impacting on the rim, uh, they may be pitted like a golf ball. Portions of the surface may break off and form pits. Critical moisture, the agglomerates become plastic, mushy, stick to the rim, bottom of the pan. This leads to catastrophic breakdown with no agglomerate formed. Below critical moisture, smaller agglomerate seeds, granulars and seeds stick together to form irregular secondary agglomerates. Granular seeds, secondary agglomerates may adhere to the primary agglomerates and form uh, raspberry form raspberries, like shape, and cause primary agglomerates to stick. Visual analysis is important and offers important information about growth mechanisms. Analysis of shape and composition is possible from tests. Right. Size, well, it depends upon lots of parameters. Size increases with higher moisture content. Larger sizes increase with the amount of liquid added. Size increase with a decrease in pins, uh, pan tilt. Lower tilt increases the residence time. Sizes increase with increasing residence time and more time to grow. Sizes increase with increasing feed, more material to the ball. Important parameters are diameter, inclination, rim height, feed rate, granulation, moisture content, and addition method. 10 degree change in inclination leads to an increase of pellet size of 25 to 
I don't know if you toy around with tilt size. Again, increasing throughput increases seed production, decreases pellet diameter, and broadens the size distribution. Relationship between moisture and pellet size. Well, pellets are formed in this figure. There's some. Basically, we're increasing moisture content this way. We're increasing pellet size this way and increasing residence time this way. So our formed someone, our formed two little liquid small balls unagglomerated, unagglomerated feed leaves at the exit. Zone two is what you want, well formed of high quality on your layering. Three, you have wetted surfaces cause more irregular shapes, smaller entities attached to themselves. Face like solid mass develop, uh, develops, discrete agglomeration doesn't form. So here's some of this zone one, two, and three, and four. Green agglomerates have a high liquid saturation, right? Basically, you want to get rid of the liquid so they can dissolve, dissolvability. They can have considerable capillary behavior and high capillary suction. Porosity is reduced during densification by tumbling and will increase liquid saturation. Porosity will increase liquid saturation. Liquid saturation is controlling parameter. Unfortunately, there's no saturation meter, right? Optimum conditions, pellets have nearly constant saturation between 80 and 95%. Right. Low saturation air may be trapped in the structure, leading to poor quality agglomerates. Low quality agglomerates are usually produced by low moisture, less than 80%. Porosity depends upon force occurring in the pan along the rim and shell of the pan. Larger pans produce, large diameter pans produce higher forces and lower porosities. Porosity is not as significantly affected by feed location. Of the binder and feed surfaces can be smoothed and densified, decreasing the porosity. Of course, there's other designs other than the simple flat one depth disc, right? You can have cones, you can have deep discs, pans within pans, back feed, discs with collars, re rolling capabilities, stepped sidewalls. Advantages of tumble agglomeration provides high porosity, high surface area, easy dissolution, and highly desirable and variable and valuable characteristics. Handles large volumes of material, simple and cheap, unsophisticated. Binders add versatility and preferred for fine particulates. Disadvantages, well, green agglomerates are temporarily temporarily formed. Curing process is usually necessary for a permanent bond. Curing is expensive and contributes to high operating costs. Size of agglomerates tend to be small. Binders and curing are needed for large agglomerates. Binders can be valuable, need recycle, adds to the higher operating costs. I think this is maybe a little bit too hard for you to read. However, I lifted it from, I think, Perry's handbook, right? And up here, I'll just read a little bit. A wedding uniformity. Wedding uniformity sits there. And if I'm trying to improve wedding uniformity, this is the little changes I would do with the formulation. How would I change the formulation? And as opposed to formulation, how I would change the process, process changes. Again, here, again, lifted from Perry's handbook. We have operating variables which maximize growth and consolidation. I was looking for maximizing growth and consolidation. 
I would, uh, these are the changes I would make for formulations, right? Formulation changes and process changes. And this one is to minimize breakage. Typical changes to minimize breakage, formulation changes, process changes. So that's a very useful table as to suggestion on how to improve your operations. And all this is coming from this very famous book, Granulation Coding Technology for Highly Va High Value Added Industries. Uh, anyway, questions, some questions for you if you like. Now going on, the uh, mixing agglomerators. Undesirable size enlargements occur naturally in mixing equipment. Just happens, right? You think it's a mixer, but actually it's an agglomerator. Why not use to advantage, hence you have mixer agglomerators. Literally all mixers can be operated as agglomerators. Mixing causes particle collisions, which cause agglomeration. Okay. Adhesive forces, however, are needed. Binders can be added easily and mixed in. Turbulence can be used to disintegrate weaker agglomerates. So oftentimes you have choppers or shredders or disintegrators that reduce particle size inside of a mixer. Such so equipment will produce the seeds necessary for agglomeration. It could be used for both batch and continuous processing. So if we take a look at some batch mixing agglomerators, Batches more common allows defined steps and time sequences to be developed to mixing dispersion first, low speed agglomeration next. Sizing next, polishing and finishing and gentle blending last phase. So I guess I have an assignment for you. I want you to go on uh, YouTube. YouTube's fantastic. And I want you to find out how they make jelly beans, right? Jelly beans being an agglomerate. So you have various, various steps in making jelly beans. And one of the more interesting ones is how the seeds for the jelly beans are made. Anyway, that's your assignment. Mixing and dispersion first. Oh, I already did that. Sequence can be quite complicated. The mechanism is similar to drum, but no feeding and withdrawal. Batch operations. Low capacities and small amounts. So here we have various mixers. Um, here we have breaker bars, excuse me, not breaker bars, but rotating discs probably, which have uh, break up the agglomerates that form. Basically, you have a rolling action. This is double count. The cone might be a double, a double cone, of course, one cone here and cone here, but also a slant in between. So that would be a slant cone, two cones, one on top, one on bottom, and a slant region in here. That would let uh, mixing from top to bottom, not improve mixing from top to bottom. As it presently stands, the material here will stay right here material here will stay right here. With a slant cone, there's a tendency to have back and forth mixing of material. This is a really bad mixer with modification can be made a very good mixer. Uh, there's a plane of symmetry here. In processing, you gotta watch out for planes of symmetry. Uh, things do not always go the way you think. So I'm feeding from both sides. What will happen is the material on this side will stay on this side, and the material on this side will stay on this side. So they're balanced. Okay, and as a result, you do not have any cross mixing going on. Right. So this is sort of bad news. You can take this and add baffles in there, and then you have cross mixing. See this, this situation here? You have internal baffles, which force cross-mixing going on. This is a great idea. 
we have our helical ribbon, a horizontal drum. Let's look at all that stuff, whatever those are. And then we have the not a mix vertical screw. What you want to watch out for is there's a nice big diamond in here that doesn't have a mixer go through it. And since it doesn't have a mixer go through it, and since you're dealing with solids with binders, this could uh, bind up as a huge big lump. Oh boy. Here it is, a mixer, and it does not mix. Okay. So you got to watch out for this piece of equipment here. Then we have these types of things, Mueller mills. Usually what will happen with these, they'll put a die at the die grid at the bottom and have the stuff squeeze through. Anyway, we have pug mills for, or pug mixers for fertilizer granulation, give you an idea of the bulk density of the material. Look at that. 25 pounds per cubic foot. That's really light. Capacity, size of the mill itself, I guess. RPM and horsepower. They don't have any information about <coughs> the material size they were making. Batching and equilibrium uh, agglomerate size is established from a balance between enlargement and disintegration mechanisms. Size depends a large amount on binder present or added. More binder yields larger agglomerates. The time to reach equilibrium balance may be too long for economic operations. Final equilibrium sizes are usually too large to them to be dry and loosely packed. Anyway. Most mixers have a disintegrator device inside, turbulizers, intensifiers, choppers, breakers. Such devices break up and control size and density. Different types of mixers can be used, mostly powder mixers and tumblers. Some are viscous mixers, which handle paste and sticky materials, probably pushing them through uh, dyes, maybe. Uh, some are dryers, which use sticky, dry sticky material to agglomerate all add energy to the mass. They can be turned on and off as desired. What you gotta watch out for is oftentimes that's overused. In a dangerous manner, oftentimes procedures, people freely add time to a procedure and that's not necessarily a great idea. Size reduction is controlled. Fragments reagglomerate with feed and finds one interesting agglomeration method is to add energy to melt a solid. Okay, just enough to get the outside melted. And then the resolification, cooling will create strong agglomerates and you're mixing during this process. The operation using mixing agglomerate, agglomeration tends to be process specific may be difficult to control. Again, the number of revolutions is an important concept. How many revolutions has the batch experienced? I mean, true revolutions. Each step has an n theta value. Percent filled may be as high as 80% at the beginning and 50% at the end due to compaction. Differences in bulk density occur as agglomerates form. A uh, power draw of the mixer can be monitored for information about the process. You run empty, you run full. As the compaction occurs, I'm sure that there's a change in power level there. Going from 80% down to 50% will change the power nature somewhat. You can understand that happening if you understand how the power draw of the mixer has changed. Power measurements should be correlated with process behavior, should be incorporated in your overall agenda, so to speak. Several power layers are to be noted, low for dry and very small agglomerates. 
medium for agglomerates forming, uh, power may increase or decrease, high for thick pastes, overly wetted material or no agglomerates. So power is a function of liquid addition too. So liquid causes more contact with the blade than just powder. Right. Mixing agglomerators are poorly understood, need rolling action to produce layers, need particle-particle collisions which occur, need both harsh and mild mixing conditions which exist, need specific studies for particular processes. So it's up and up to uh, investigations. Generalities are often true, but not always. High rotational speeds cause low porosity, smaller, tougher particles. Lower rotational speeds cause speed causes high porosity and higher particles. Close clearances causes small particles. Close clearances, clearances being a breaking, a breaking uh, device. Anyway, let's go on to continuous mixers. Mix, uh, mechanisms similar to a drum, often called intensive mixers. Equipment is divided into zones, the mixing zone, the binder addition zone, and the agglomeration zone. Again, disintegrators are used as, mach as a machine option, right? Turbulizers, intensifiers, choppers, breakers. Reagglomeration may increase density and or aid in the development of desirable quantities like incidization. Here's the turbulator. Turbulator is often the pin mill. Turbulator is an interesting name, isn't it? Turbulator. A pin mill is more accurate, all right, because you have a helix of pins in there, and the processing area is the outer perimeter, the volume between the pin, the ends of the pin and the wall. So the material is in the outer perimeter. It's used to make seeds, primarily. Fine and aerated, anyway. I wrote a pen, uh, paper on this, got published somewhere, I forget where. Continuous operation usually has a wide particle size distribution, typical due to its disintegration. Usually requires screening and recycle, and less defined particle sizes has less defined particle size, different densities depending upon particle packing in the agglomerate. Suspension solids agglomerated, suspended solids agglomeration. Solids are suspended in gas, which causes the motion, collisions, coalescence, and agglomeration. Techniques include fluidized beds and spouted beds. Spouted beds were developed as an alternative to fluidized beds that, that are too coarse for good fluidization, right? Alternative to fluidization of solids that are too coarse for fluidization. Some, not everything's fluidizable, right? So you go to a spotted bed. Anyway, here's some examples of a fluidized bed. You have fluidizing air, then you have some sort of liquid supply, and then these can also be partitioned and heated differently. <coughs> Excuse me. You may have incorporated spray nozzles for the binder. <laughs> you have solid speed staging. And this would be fluidized bed granulator. Excuse me. Then you have your typical collection. Gas stream is going to carry off par particles no matter what. And you need probably a uh, cyclone followed by what, three or four, what is it, uh, scrubber, uh, electrostatic precipitator, bag house. Finally, you may need to burn it off, uh, burn the stream off to make sure nasty materials do not get off into the environment. Typically with a fluidized bed, just to throw some, so you're looking for about one third the pressure drop across the 
grid here, that high pressure drop will give you a uniformity of gas going through the screen, so to speak. This is an important screen. The screens are not necessarily blocking, going to block the material we'll collect down in the bottom down here. So, uh, anyway, I think I probably got this from uh, uh, Wallace's book that I like so much. I'm not sure if I've referenced it or not. Spouted bed is just like it says, it spouts. It has a spout right in the middle. You have a uh, atomizing nozzle in there. You should take a look at my atomizing course. And anyway, interesting arrangement of different things. We take a look here, fluidized bed on granulation, you have variable material and the effect of increasing that variable. All right. Again, I probably lifted that out of uh, Perry's handbook, uh, chemical engineering handbook. Anything with a 20 is probably chapter 20 in that handbook. And they got it from this cookbook here, which spouted beds, uh, one to five microns used for material that have high caking tendencies. Huh. How about that? One to five millimeters is big. Uh, spouted, well, I mean, agglomerates can be big too, but a bed inside five millimeters is big. Right. Spouted beds have more regular motion, collision with the walls and other have high energy, severe particle attrition can occur. Suspended solid, solids agglomerator can either be batch or continuous with and without heating and cooling. Binders are also sprayed, the liquid feed is often sprayed on the particles. Attrition of any large particles occur which generates fines and seeds. Less intensive, intensive interactions occur in a fluidized bed. Agglomerates are suspended loose state. Abrasion transfer occurs. Crushing, layering are less likely to occur. Porosities of agglomerates are higher. Right? Agglomerates are, are, are not large. Fluidized beds are very limited in making large agglomerates. As one chap said to me one time, he says, um, fluidized beds can instatize your product. I said, how's that? Well, instatization is very important, he said, and apparently his experience was fluidized beds are the only ones that can instatize the products the way they wanted it done. So. Uh, fluidized beds do not make large agglomerates. So you may have a cascade of beds may help make larger agglomerates. Supporting tasks, obviously, nozzles and wheels for sprays, dust collection, cleaning, of course, air cleaning, even distribution of gas and sprays. More uniform the process, the more uniform the product internal heating, cooling, bed partitioning by overflow by weirs, nozzles can be placed below the beds, cyclones can be placed inside beds, continuous suspended solids agglomeration is useful for increased capacity and product quality. Right. Advantage is a stationary optimized operation uh, agglomerates are removed continuously via the rotary valve, oversized or crushed, returned, lines that carry over are removed via the gas stream, wet scrubbers by gauss electrostatic precipitators. Fluidized beds can give remarkable reproducibility if operated correctly. Beds can also be segregated. In fact, you can make a fluidized bed, say you had a spiral, 
okay, as you feed in the center of that spiral, okay, and take the product or the exit to the bed off the outer perimeter opening. You can have a fixed residence time in the bed, or you can certainly have the bed uh, have less variation in the residence time if you use a spiral wall inside a fluidized bed. Uh, to what degree or whether that's important to you, uh, who knows? It's an interesting idea. Undesired effects occur, of course, you're going to have break, uh, caking and breakup everywhere. Redesign is often necessary to prevent caking. One way of preventing caking is you remove the impingement geometry. If you've got impingement in there, just take out that chunk of, chunk of metal. Then you have people say, oh, oh, it's going to validate, uh, invalidate the uh, warranty we have on the piece of equipment. Well, if the piece of equipment ain't working anyway, and you're getting lousy product, and removing the material or removing certain impingement areas helps then why would you want to worry about uh, such a minor thing as a warranty? Anyway, let's go on to screening and binders, right? Let's talk about binders first, screening second. Significant agglomeration tendencies exist naturally, especially for small, small particles and due to van der Waal forces. Tendencies to increase, tendencies increase considerably with moisture and applied force. Plasticity helps agglomeration, increases agglomerate strength. Remember, you can actually bend this material together. Uh, increasing, increasing temperatures, of course, uh, run cold to prevent agglomeration <coughs> or run colder to change the nature of your agglomeration. <coughs> Excuse me. All binding mechanisms rely on surfaces joining or interfaces joining. Molecular interactions are important. Surface structure and distance are important. Finds may help. In size enlargements, accumulated contact points, they form bridges, can reduce the, dense, the distance between particles. Fines also increase the attractiveness or attractive forces. Soft uh, materials deform and bind under compression and shear. High temperatures aid in this, low temperatures don't. Momentarily softening and melting can occur at contact. Uh, Instantization, uh, solidification produces solid uh, bridges. So I, I got a weird experiment I want you to do, uh, just for funsies. I want you to take two hot dogs and microwave them in the oven, uh, excuse me, microwave them, and take a look at their, the nature of their surf, surfaces after you have microwaved them. And you can see that the surface change has been significant with microwaves. Uh, I don't know what the interior looks like, but there's a certain uh, case hardening or drying of the surface with the microwave cooking of a hot dog. Now I want you to take the two hot dogs, put them back in there. You can take new hot dogs if you want and have them touch it at one single point. And I want you to microwave them like that, same way. And you'll find that at the point of where the two material, the two hot dogs touch, they're probably going to be fused together or agglomerated together. So I want you to take note of that. Now, why does that occur? Well, you have surface energy from one hot dog, surface energy from the other hot dog. And they contact at a single point, so that means they have twice the energy. As a result, that contact point has a completely different environment than uh, just a regular hot dog surface. As a result, they're likely fused together. Anyway, I hope you can eat the hot dogs afterwards. It's kind of an interesting agglomeration. You could have stuff microwaved, agglomerated, you can patent that if you want. I don't know if it's been patented or not. But uh, 
it's an interesting idea. It goes along the way here of uh, melting at the contact point. Dissolution and recrystallization bind by forming solid bridges. And of course, there's other natural binding curves. Uh, another experiment you might want to do, take a small slip of paper, put it on the table top, put your finger down on the small piece of paper, see if you can pick it up. Okay. And it doesn't, doesn't work very well, does it? Now I want you to lick your finger and then put it down on the paper and pick it up. That's agglomeration. <laughs> Anyway, those are two tricks, one in the microwave and one with just a simple sheet of paper teaches you uh, binding, so to speak. Two examples of binding. They got this fantastic video on YouTube. It says particle, particle behavior in microgravity where they have this plastic uh, bladder filled, transparent plastic bladder filled with particles. And uh, they mix it up and you, they photograph what happens. And it's fascinating, these particles uh, agglomerating. Well, they don't agglomerate. They form more of a uh, flocculent. Well, flocculent being a agglomerate, I guess. It's pretty cool. I hope it's still around when you review these tapes. Anyway, all around are agglomerates, the snowball is an agglomerate. And we already talked about snow, snow people. Anyway, agglomerations of pain <laughs> in many processes. And natural binders are present. Natural binders may not work well. The most common natural binder is water. Okay. Additional binders have been have to be added. This increases agglomerate strength. Hopefully, and uh, not change the processing conditions. Lubricants are also available to reduce the friction between particles. As I said, when particles touch each other, there, there can be substantial friction, which then causes uh, melting, high temperatures. Contact points, again, are quite different than uh, non-contact points. They're like an entirely different environment. I'm not quite sure what increase in surface energy there is when you add or you contact two surfaces. Does that double the surface energy? I mean, one surface brings one set of energy, the other surface brings another energy level. When you combine them, is that twice the energy level at that contact point? Again, contact points are interesting. Lubricants are also available to reduce co-friction and friction, results in more contact points, can result in higher agglomeration densities and strengths. Lubricants reduce the coefficient of friction between material and the compacting tool as well. Basically, what is it? Release agents? Is that? Binder lubricants, binders and lubricants are process specific. Is it organic or inorganic? Binders, lubricants, solid, a liquid. Uh, is there a gas lubricants? Is there gas binders? I'm curious about that. Gas binders, that's kind of an interesting concept there. Anyway, forms what shapes, films, bridges, whatnot. Table of additives, binders and lubricants follow. Let's see what we got here. So we have all sorts of binders and we have all sorts of lubricants and we have applications in catalysts, ceramics, chemicals, foods, polymetallurgy, uh, pharmaceuticals, and making pills. Okay. You got all kinds of different materials here. Water, yeah, water, AB, anyway, polymetallurgy. I ran into a guy, he didn't like me too much. Anyway, that's all right. Here you have the material and the binder and what equipment was used. I think it was in powder metallurgy. A quite rude person. Anyway, we have uh, physical state by function, by chemical type, organic, inorganic, 
maybe even inert tar. Well, you take a look at a serious binder, you take a look at asphalt, it's just binded together, right? Except the binder is actually, you can't really consider, if you look at asphalt, you can't really consider the tar a binder. It's more of a carry, I mean, it's much more, uh, anyway, physical state, liquid, semi-solid, solid, right? Mm. Then you got uh, hydrophobic and uh, hydrophilic, and then you have insoluble, insoluble, waterproof, uh, aqueous, organic, inactive, active, Chemical matrix, chemical reactions, floating around there. Ferrotech. These guys are, I think, these guys, really nice group of guys. Yeah. Uh, I was going to be a, I, one of these companies I was going to be a sales rep for. It, 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 it found out that I was not quite the salesman. Okay. Not as not as uh, thought, uh, not as much as I thought I was. Anyway, <laughs> inactive films. Anyway, so it uh, gives you some here. And again, I lifted this from various sources in here. Various sources. Maybe I should go back and show them to you again. Anyway, again, I've lifted them from Perry's handbook. I got them from Ferrotech. Got them from the different different ways. And what do we have here? A cold crushing strength fiber dust briquettes. Right? So you can have internals. They don't have to be particles. They don't have to be a liquid to be a binder. They don't have, they can be uh, basically uh, reinforced material can be a binder. Reinforcements can be a binder. So, straw and brick, for example, is typically, see that typically in, used, and that's a binder. So, let's see what we got here. We didn't look up in here. Examples of some typical liquid lubricants. Hardening in days, cold crushing strength briquette. Okay, so it's, uh, and aging without reinforcement, with reinforcement, 50%. So I'm getting much, much greater 50%. So all this agglomeration is all around us. And, you know, when I first started uh, doing this area, I didn't realize how significant agglomeration was. So film and bridge binders are normal are normally liquids, cover the particle, collect the contact points. You have surface tension, capillary forces are active, only small amounts are needed. Porosity and surface area can be unaffected. Um, matrix forming of binders fill the entire void and pore space. Example of that, I guess, is cement. Cement and then asphalt. And a number of uh, chemical additives, uh, chemical reactive binders, forms compounds at the contact points, salts in high strength. Straw and bricks, metal shavings, and uh, dust briquettes. Onward and upward to screening. Screening uh, can be very important to you. And if you're not paying attention to screening, uh, then you should, I guess. Right. Uh, what happens in industry, as we all know, you have a problem, you have a process that's never really worked well, and you just accept it. You just accept it. So along comes... Uh, change in attitude and uh, you no longer accept it, so you start to investigate. The more you investigate, the more you learn, the more likely that you can prove the process. Now then, after you learn how to improve the process to get approval to make the change, now there's the problem right there. 
Uh, screens are used usually industrial continuous processes. Sieves are for a laboratory. So you have screens and sieves, just call them screens. Undersized or fines, they pass through. Oversized or tails, do not. When passed through a series of screens, solids are sized. Dry screening is most frequently done, but wet screening sometimes is out there. Screens typically run from four inches to 400 mesh. Right. And here's a picture of screens. Uh, let's talk about this one right here for the first, this, this one right here. What you want is the oversized and the undersized to give you a sharp cut right there, sharp cut. That usually doesn't happen, right? Is I have feed here. That's the feed distribution. And you're going to divide it into the undersized feed, right? And the oversized feed. And this is probably mesh size here. That's why the small, the larger numbers are the smaller stuff, right? So you have this X and this B here value. And when they're close together, X, well, wait a minute, X is, anyway, uh, there's a ratio there that's very important. Give you a measure cut. In the oversized, you're always gonna have some sort of fines. And the undersized, you may, hopefully you don't have any oversized in the undersized. But we know that uh, things, for some reason, sneak through or are magical. Or they obtain that orientation just right that they slip through the screen due to the fact that uh, particle shape, for example, would let you slip through a screen. So you wish to have a really sharp cut, but no, you're not going to get it. You're going to have over, oversized in the fines. And then you're going to have the undersized and the oversized. Anyway, this is also a very intriguing uh, bit of information up here, just for the concept behind it. OK, if I'm a particle, how many times I go to the screen? I got to the screen. Finally, I got to the screen. Oh, I got to the screen in this area here. And I got bounced back. Oh, look at that. I finally got to the screen. Finally got to the screen. And I got to this area up here, and I can finally bounce back. I don't go through the screen. The only way I get to go through the screen is when it's like that. Perfectly, I'm perfectly sized, I go through the screen. Now, that takes a lot of time. Okay. First thing, first problem is I had to go through a bed of material. Usually, there's often a I should say often there's a bed of material on the screen. And I have to float around in that bed before I get to the screen. And after the screen, I got to get through the screen. So it's, it's a bloody, bloody, terrible process. If you take a look at it. Again, I could arrive at the screen anywhere in here and only a small number of approaches will get me through that screen. So there's a probability of this happening. It's low. So I have to visit five, 10, 15 times. So this is probability of going through the screen. So if I've been there 15 times, I might be able to get through it. 20 times, I might be able to get through it. So I have to wonder, I'm, I'm traveling through the wilderness, so to speak, until I hit the screen, the wilderness being the, the retention volume on the screen. Now that's a real problem right there. You really want the screen in a manner where there isn't any retention volume, right? And when you get rid of the retention volume, you have the opportunity of screening really well. So horizontal screening is terrible, terrible. You want to use a banana screen 
or a screen on a tell. We'll show you a few of these as we get to it. But those are real biggie graphs there. This, uh, this idea of this cut, the idea that you're not going to get it, and I'm not sure what this A was. Okay. Anyway, here's the si size distribution and variation. You got the um, variation in cumulative size with sitting time, right? So first minute through the 20th minute, and you see that the, uh, the, uh, this is high finds content that's being retained in the volume above the screen or sieve. And then you have, after 20 minutes, that fraction has been allowed to pass through, right? So it's an interesting idea. Right. The situation is, again, you don't want anything on the screen. You want these particles, when they hit the screen, to go right through it. And here we have mass fraction passing through a function of time. Apparently, there's two or three regions, right? 100 seconds up there so they can get through. But this is an awful long time for gravity to work. I mean, it's working by gravity. And uh, these particle sizes, gravity doesn't work very well, which is another point. So, gravity doesn't work in the uh, Stokes drag regime at 20 microns, you're probably in the Stokes drag regime. Anyway, this is kind of intriguing. This is coming out of Australia. Here you have the particle size. Now, you don't know that these are clinging particles. You don't know that these are clinging particles, but they're there, and they're there because of static cling. Okay, so it's very been a very hot and dry situation down in Australia. And suddenly the monsoons hit, moisture, humidity goes through the roof, and shorts out all the electric charges involved, so the clinging fines fall off and they form this distribution here. So one night you have this distribution, the following morning when it's high humidity, your fines have doubled. That's pretty funny, huh? You're sitting there just because of night, uh, day to night or night to day, uh, your size distribution changes just because of time. That's a terrible thing to happen to a person, I tell you, I tell you. Can't, it makes you believe that science doesn't exist. Anyway, moving right along, variety, many varieties of screens and sieves, micro screens, fluids are, particles are fluidized, sieve surfaces are submerged, high velocities occur. So you go to high velocity so you can get to uh, high Reynolds numbers. So gravity in that, it will work. Equipment is either static or dynamic. You have a grizzly, it's very, uh, basically a heavy grid, metal bars for coarse material, set at an angle. Material moves down the group from the top to bottom, wider, opening is wider at the bottom. The, the, the uh, bars are thicker at the top. This is to be thicker at the top. They're sort of keystone shaped, right? Once you get through the top, there's no other resistance. Okay. Hopefully the small particles fall out first. The larger particles do not pass through as readily. Usually self-cleaning. Sieves employ wet sub what separation for smaller particles. And again, increases the Reynolds number and increases the separation. Constructed of horizontal bars, that's what we're talking about, the grizzly. Low cost, no moving parts. Generally, fine particles must be agitated in some way <laughs> for passage. Vibration, oscillating, sieving, yeah, there you go. Oh, sorry. 
So here we have the screen type. Notice vibrating, rotary, rotating, reciprocating, oscillating, vibration. So already they're they're not sitting on their on their behinds. They're really active here. So all good ideas. Notice the word stokes up here. All right. You got high speed, inclined, there's a good idea. Vertical. Anyway, what kind we got here? Stokes. Frequency, size range, wet, dry, material type. Now this slide is very misleading. A is a very misleading slide. They ought to redo it. By mass balance, I have powder here, very fine powder plus large particles. By mass balance, this should leave and it should get thinner as it goes down. That leaves, that leaves, that leaves, that leaves. So a banana screen, you don't want to have the banana screen layered like that to that depth. It should be almost clear down in this region here. You can see this is the, the way the breaker bars are shaped. So you uh, want to have a curve that helps you have uh, gravity acting in the same direction as opposed to perhaps this one. But uh, as I pull off the fines, then the stream's got to be thinner. And it's not been emphasized here. This is called a banana screen because it's shaped like a banana. Okay. At least that's what I've been told, right? But to get around the patent, what you do is you have screen here at one angle, another screen here or at that angle, a third screen there at that angle. So you have different screens at different angles. Now, if you take a walk, you got a horizontal, which is terrible. You Here you go. You want... Uh, Again, an angle to it. Problem with the angle is if you feed it too quickly, then it accumulates all on the bottom here. And then you have, you want to have it at an angle where there's sufficient area where the material is not, doesn't form a layer like this. This is, this is tough screening in here where there's a layer. Because you got, again, you got to get the material to the screen to pass through. You can have it, vibrate one one direction and oscillating the other direction eccentric you can have it oscillating oscillating vibrator oscillating All right what you don't want to be is around these things when they hit their natural frequency i don't know if you understand natural frequency or not it's where you put in one level of vibration and you get a factor of 10 level of vibration out so it's a terrible, terrible situation. Be around those things when it starts to make a, a grab at you. Here we have a trommel, what might be referred to as a trommel. We have, uh, let's see which way we're going to, basically a, a, a rotating you would first have this at an angle, it's rotating. You would have uh, the finer screens at the, when the feed first enters, you would have a wash all along the top of this and uh, you would wash the fines away. Then this come further on down, you reach another opening, a little bit larger, that catches your intermediates by the way. You've already done a size separation up here. So that water, uh, that stream is taken away one direction. Then you have the fine, uh, a larger fraction size taken away. That to be another stream. And then you have things that are wide open here. Right. So you have an assignment. These trommels are typically used. Uh, in uh, videos on gold mining operations. So, by the way, these screen operations is also used. You can see grizzlies. So your assignment is I want you to go and watch uh, Gold Rush, is it, uh, on, 
uh, TV or YouTube or YouTube has a lot of gold mine videos on it. Uh, obviously, the gold is finer size than the big boulders. So you might see a tremble of the two. You'll see scraping operations going on. In this case, it's a wash plant. Oftentimes, you're one of the big things about gold mining is you're basically washing gravel. You're washing away the fines. Gold is usually finer than the stone. You're washing away the fines, gold fines. They're smaller, but heavy as well. So, so your assignment to get acquainted with this sort of equipment is to uh, YouTube or on television or wherever to watch a series of gold mining operations. You can see a grizzly in action. You can actually it'd be a good source for used equipment if you need it because a lot of those gold miners just don't quite make it. They have these trumbles or these operations that are not being utilized. Revolving screens, perforated metal set at angle, holes vary in sizes, smaller holes first, fines removed first. Well, if you stage this, right, the, um, take this one here, right? You got the top one's going to catch the course. This one's going to catch the intermediate, and the smallest is going down at the bottom. So, again, and they're tilted to prevent this. Okay, special screens like banana screens are woven, woven wire for coal. Vibrating and gyrating is typical. Right. Heated springs to sufficiently dry to reduce binding. There's blinding and then there's binding. It's similar. They're spelled similarly and they are similar. Okay, rubber screens are possible. Have a low percent area, but why opens wide for increased weight. That's that's kind of uh, problems. Anyway, ideal cuts, right? Ideal smallest in the oversized would be the largest in the undersized, right? Smallest particle in the oversized would be just larger than the largest particle in the undersized. Separation depends greatly on the shape of the particle. The regular particles, the second dimension may be the defining dimension. Cut is not sharp for needles and porous or fibrous particles, right? Cut is not sharp when large particles carry smaller particles. Cuts are generally poor for particles smaller than 150 mesh classification. Screens only work down to a certain size limit and then they don't work anymore. You're going to have to go to a classifier. Classifier is much more elegant. Okay, uh, screening classifier, kind of interesting about that. Screen, uh, classifier, there's three or four ways of washing particles out of smaller particles, washing smaller particles out of larger particles. And uh, that's what classifier does. Cut and capacity are two opposing factors. Sharp cut means capacity is small. Large capacity means reduction in sharpness. Okay. Need to have a reasonable balance for a specific processing need. Overall chance of a particle passing through the openings depends upon the number of presentations of the screen. That's going to be proportional to the rotational speed or the agitation rate or the vibration rate. More vibrations, the more presentation there is to the screen. The screen is overloaded, which is not a good idea. Number of presentations and chances of passage is reduced. There's a proportion of volume or fill heights. Okay. The chances of package is reduced. Probability of screen passage depends upon the fraction of screen surface available to the openings, the ratio of defining dimensions of width of the opening. 
Number of contacts between the screen and the particle depends upon agitation. Agitation should increase throughout. If all three are constants, passage rate is constant. So let's see what we can do here. For capacitive screens, capacity is mass per time. Series of screens, you have particle size. This dp is particle size. Particle size equals screen opening or our mesh size approximately. Size of the mesh, sorry. Not mesh number, but size. Number of openings is proportional one over d squared, or the diameter squared. Mass of particles d cubed. So number of presentations to the screen, number of openings per unit area. So we take uh, basically mass per time area is then uh, mass flow uh, number of presentations proportional n, that's sort of mass flow rate, and the mass is d cubed and divided by the opening area. And then you have vibration particle size. Mass per area per time, right? So you quickly find out capacity goes down for smaller particles. Smaller particles are more difficult to separate with screening, right? So our capacity of series of strains divided by mesh opening should be constant at fixed agitation. The slow, uh, lower screens, the ones that are for fines, should be larger, should be larger in diameter, more area, right? Fines need to be free-flowing. Non-free-flowing particles will cause you to agglomerate on the screen. Non-free-flowing materials have some sort of binder already because that makes them non-free-flowing. So since it has a binder and it tends to be, agglomeration tends to be a natural process, you can have agglomeration on the screens, which means uh, something needs to be done to prevent that from happening. Poison, the way you stop agglomeration is you put in a surface poison. After agglomeration, screening may be necessary. Binder may be present to cause difficulties. And screening and prevention of agglomeration is important. Agglomeration can plug a screen. Solutions may include keeping the solids moving, heating to melt the agglomerate away, either by radiation, hot air, or steam. That's interesting, steam, hot air. I haven't thought about steam. Adding a screen lubricant to prevent binding. Moisture may help to lower glomerate strengths. Anyway. Other problems, too much material on the screen. There you go. Possibility of on the screen having classification, uh, stratification happening. Density effects go easy with this sticky tackiness. Oblique approach, approaches aren't helpful. Again, this is factor of particle shape. Humidity and moisture effects. Dry particles are more mobile than damp particles. There you go. Dry particles will also cause you to have more static electricity effects. So you're screening away in a very dry climate and suddenly with a stream, you have static buildup. Mm. Particle systems damp and moist, further dilutions will improve mobility. Mm. No values, electrostatic effects. This is an interesting area in screening operations. I hope you, for those of you who have experienced static charges, I hope you got your screens grounded. Anyway, it's interesting. No value screening, the results vary considerably. Right, look, you have Grizzly's uh, capacity in tons per hour per square mesh size. Here, one to five, and it's 0.05 to two. Reference one, reference two. Vibrating screens, anyway. You have significant differences.
More reasons for poor performance. Well, chemistry and physics change with size. Major flow regimes, uh, flow regimes occur and flows are different. Screens are inertial devices. Particles are not in the inertial regime. That's the idea that Screens are uh, high Reynolds number items and uh, particles are stokes. Small particles are surfaces, large particles are objects. And then you have lots of surface effects present, surface chemistry, van der Waals. Besides those mentioned, the low opening fractions for smaller screens. Anyway, I am wishing you a happy agglomeration. I hope you have don't have any problems with that. This is not my telephone number for those of you. And of course, there's all these references you can get a hold of. Anyway, thank you very much and uh, happy screening, so to speak, or happy agglomeration. <laughs>